intelligence and facts would be fixed around the policy of war. There's the proof that the intelligence, all this justification in, in quotes for the war, was a fraud, a fraud from day one. The project for a new American century, the think tank, uh, with the report called Strengthening America's Defenses. This is frankly a demand for full spectrum dominance by the United States. I think the most chilling aspect of the Project for a New American Century document is this kind of transformation uh, of our foreign policy, this kind of strengthening of America's uh, defenses is uh, a revolutionary change and is not going to come, uh, it's not going to happen at all quickly absent a new catalyst of massive proportions, for example a new Pearl Harbor. In Crawford, Texas, we found individuals who believe the weapons of mass destruction were found in Iraq. Uh, no weapons of mass destruction were found. Are you kidding me? Do you buy that? Yes. Of course there were mass. Of course there were. David, uh, there were, there doc, were, there were, there were. Nye, 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 nye. This guy would make a great citizen in George Orwell's fictitious 1984. If we took him all away, does that still mean that if if he had the capability, would he still see that's that's in the mind? Well, first, well, she's got an ad on TV that said so he's he lying. lied. My son died. You know, he lied about lie to what? Nobody. What did what did George Bush lie about? He said he was going to protect weapons this country. Weapons of mass destruction. Huh? So that well, man, what took to keep the enemy was, out of our backyards. He never said they were going to be nobody killed. That's war. I think they're saying that Bush lied about WMDs, not about troops were going to die. But, but, but did he though? But did he though? Those, those, those weapons were there. The authoritarian powers of the state, which are available to, uh, to government, is very dangerous. And I think we live in a state, uh, we live in states, both the United States and the UK, where the, the powers to question, uh, to call in evidence, uh, to demand explanation, to hold to account those who are in control, are gradually systematically being weakened. This is very dangerous in a democracy. <laughs> Now, Dick Cheney and John Bolton and others have been saying Iran poses an immediate danger. They could get a nuclear weapon before we know it. All the same things they said about Iraq. And so we have to do something about that now. You know, he said the same thing about Iraq. And it, like you said, he was caught red-handed. It's proven to be lies. Why should we believe him about Iran? I'm pleased to tell you, American people, that the National Intelligence Estimate just put out on Iran says that Iran cannot possibly have a nuclear weapon for 10 more years. Let me say that one more time. Iran can't be a nuclear power, weapons-wise, for 10 more years. We have to look at whether our governments are creating enemies um, so that they can justify what they do. Of course, two of the biggest funders of American presidential campaigns are the oil industry and the arms industry. And it's in their interests that we invade places like Iraq. We're going to let the Israelis, or we're going to do it ourselves, attack the nuclear facilities in Iran. Now, people say, that's crazy. That is absolutely crazy. I agree. The problem is, folks, the people running our policy toward Iraq and Iran were widely known in the 1980s when I was briefing the vice president and others as the crazies, okay? The crazy. You come in on, on Monday morning and somebody would say, Guess what the crazies did late Friday night? And you'd know who, exactly who the reference was. It was to Wolfowitz, it was to Pearl. So all the fo same folks, some of them who have d deserted the sinking ship like proverbial rats, okay? But it was Fife, Wolfowitz, and the rest of them. They were the crazies. There's, uh, there's a lot of other people that are, uh, have a dis dissenting uh, opinion about this war and uh, then has, has another view of this war other than Cindy Sheehan. And other people have lost sons in, uh, in this war and daughters. She needs to really go home and you know uh, do, do this little uh, protest some other way besides trying to make things sound like she's the only uh, voice of America. 
Three weeks later, this gentleman and many others got their wish. Free speech was banned for hundreds of square miles around Bush's Crawford Ranch. Now you can only protest on private property or designated free speech zones where no one can even see your protest. Look, tourist stuff's popped up here now. Let freedom ring. <laughs> we decided to cap off our day in Crawford by traveling down the public highway to where the Secret Service had blocked off the public road two miles before the entrance to Bush's ranch. We were promptly told, as if America is now a third world police state, to get out of there, despite the fact that we were credentialed press. You need to get back in your car and can't see Really? Yeah, you need to get off the road. Oh, we're oh, off the road, okay. Or is it hard to stand over here? Past your cars, where you can stand. Oh, but the barricades are here. So let me get this straight. You believe that the U.S. government crashed those airplanes under the World Trade Center? Yes, the evidence shows it. You're full of <laughs> Take a hike. The whole point about 9-11 is that it gave a pretext for a preconceived plan. That plan is in the PNAC document, uh, which precedes 9-11 uh, by almost a year. It became clear to us that the administration was using the corruption of intelligence to justify a war that did not happen. In my opinion, when you look at the details of 9-11 and you read reports that there were planes that supposedly um, contained terrorists but did not take off that day, um, and that the Flight 93, for example, was supposed to be aimed at either Capitol Hill or the White House. You're in fact looking at a coup d'etat that they wanted to destroy the infrastructure of American government. There are a host of unanswered questions on all of this. The reason they're unanswered is because this president, this administration, will not answer the questions. Why is it that perhaps the biggest question of all, why is it that after, on 9-11, 8.20 a.m., when it was undoubtedly uh, without any question that one of those planes had been hijacked between 8.20 and 9.38 when the Pentagon was hit, an hour and 20 minutes, no U.S. airplane was put into the air. There were drills um, on the day of 9-11 in which um, the American Defense Force was supposed to be dealing with mock hijackings. Um, obviously, those would have slowed down the response of national defense to the hijacked um, airliners. Um, if American passenger jets go off course and they are um, tackled by American fighter jets, the default position is to shoot them down and yet in this case of course uh, none of that happened. There was the uh, Andrew Air Force Base 10 miles uh, from Washington, it has a squadron of uh, F-16 fighters, none of those was put into the air. This is absolutely almost incredible, the most powerful military technological country in the world, albeit under a, a terrifying attack, was not able to put planes into the air which actually could probably have stopped at least the second and third hits. And we've got to ask why George Bush sat there with a group of school children for 16 minutes after he'd been alerted to a plane going into the second tower. The president's in Sarasota. He's told that the second plane has hit uh, the, the World Trade Center. And the Secret Service guy immediately says, we're out of here. The president stays for 30 minutes, folks, for 30 minutes. Now, how do you explain that? I've talked to all manner of Secret Service people. They say, we're out of here was exactly the right reaction. Everyone knew where the president was. If not the president, you might have had some concern for these little kids. Why did he stay for 30 minutes? Why was he countermanded? The implication, of course, is he knew exactly what was going on, that he knew that he wasn't under attack. I think all of this needs to be explained. It wasn't in the congressional report. There was no serious examination of this. And there is the amazing statement made in the official congressional report uh, that the American authorities have not managed to trace the source of the funding. And then the most amazingly disingenuous statement ultimately is it of little consequence. It is of massive consequence. The head of Pakistani intelligence at the ISI, Lieutenant uh, Mahmoud Ahmed, uh, requested uh, Omar Sheikh, uh, who is a well-known Islamic extremist who is now actually in prison in Pakistan, to wire $100,000 to Mohammed Atta, who was the lead hijacker. It is absolutely astonishing 
uh, that that lead has never been followed up. For people to dismiss these questioners as conspiratorial advocates or uh, conspiratorial theorists, that's completely out of line because the, the questions remain because the, the president who should be able to answer them will not. We have plenty of evidence that the attack on Afghanistan uh, was planned. Uh, because after the negotiations with the Taliban broke down in the United States, I think they went to Houston in Texas uh, in about July, and there were later discussions at about this time in Berlin, uh, where U.S. Uh, officials made absolutely clear to the Taliban representatives in this famous phrase, uh, either uh, we will provide you with a carpet of gold, in other words, if you supply a pipeline across Afghanistan, uh, you ensure the security of the country, you guard that pipeline, then we can do a deal with you, otherwise we will bury you in a carpet of bombs. In the years since 9-11, scores of highly regarded individuals have gone public to express their serious doubts about 9-11. These include former presidential advisor and CIA analyst Ray McGovern, the father of Reaganomics and former assistant secretary of the U.S. Treasury, Dr. Paul Craig Roberts, BYU physics professor Stephen Jones, former German defense minister Andres von Bülow, former MI5 officer David Shaler, former Blair cabinet member Michael Meacher, former chief economist for the Department of Labor during President George W. Bush's first term, Dr. Morgan Reynolds, and many more. In early June of 2006, we traveled to Chicago to meet with fellow 9-11 truth seekers and expose the official story as a fraud. You cannot hide the truth. You will not hide the truth. It's coming out. Your crimes are coming out. Ladies and gentlemen, 9-11 Chicago, we had a chance to again speak with former MI5 agent Andy Michon. I'm convinced that 9-11 was an inside job. And the reasons, there are a number of compelling reasons why I think it was an inside job. Primarily uh, the collapse of the Twin Towers, which look to me to be controlled demolitions. Um, also the collapse of Building 7, the World Trade Center complex. Um, also the fact that the air defenses were stood down that day. Um, who benefited from the attacks, of course. So there were a lot of put options put on the airlines that suffered during those attacks. It's a whole range of different evidence that adds up to uh, something very, very suspicious about 9-11. I feel passionately that we need to expose the government um, involvement in 9-11 because if we don't, they will keep doing this in future. There will be another attack in order to justify another unjustifiable war. We also spoke with Dr. Morgan Reynolds. No matter how much our inert uh, public wants to avoid this, it's eating away. It's, too ma it's, it's willful denial, willful ignorance. It's eating away at the underbelly of America. And we aren't going to solve our problems by ignoring 9-11. The biggest smoking gun uh, then and now is WTC7. How can anyone watch it without some kind of a psyop or a verbiage accompanying it and not look at that and say, hey, that building was just demolished. Just the way the, the, the uh, Las Vegas Sands uh, was, or the Seattle uh, Stadium, etc. Just, you, you, there's no way around that. Here we are in uh, so-called broad daylight, it's 5.20 p.m., and we've got cameras on it, and uh, what other explanation can there be for this uh, very conventional looking collapse when under seven seconds? There's, there's just that just has crime inside job written all over it we need real convictions we need arrests we need prosecutions we also had a chance to speak to professor Stephen Jones who is a doctor of physics concerning new bombshell evidence that conclusively proves that thermite was used to cut the main pillars in the World Trade Center towers there is this molten metal, molten material flowing out of uh, the South Tower just before.